Chapter 11, September 22nd, 1983. I kept hoping it wouldn't come down to this, but a week later I'm standing in front of the sign-up sheet for the school play. It's not that I'm anti-theater. I did costumes for spring play last year. Anything goes. The songs were cheesier than the entire state of Wisconsin, and nobody really knew how to tap dance, which made the whole two hours sound like a metallic stampede. But I had a surprisingly good time putting together all those sailor outfits. But it's just that when you're deciding what kind of nerd to be in high school, there are only a few tracks you can pick. Kate, Dash, and Milton have all committed, in some cases overcommitted, to band and academics. Doing crew, doing crew for the play can fit into any kind of nerd profile, but actually getting on stage is reserved for a special kind of nerd, which in some cases also has crossover potential with lower ranks of popular kids, but which also involves singing in public and flirting a lot and laughing so loud that your back teeth show. Not really my thing. I take it a step closer, and I can see the sheet is much more filled in than when Mr. Hauser had it. Those first few names must have been the people who knew who knew to find him and get their spots before the list went up in a public forum. I looked around once, twice, making sure that nobody's watching. It seems like the monster that is Hawkins High is slumbering. Or maybe it's just de devouring someone else in some far off classroom that I can't see. I step closer and the names on the list come into focus. Picking up the pencil dangling next to the list by a piece of string. I hunt through the time slots tomorrow afternoon for one that's still open. And then I see it right there in loops and twirls. Tammy Thompson. Tammy Thompson. She's going to be at the auditions. I go back into the loop from class. Me staring at her. Her staring at Steve. Me staring at Steve. I think how she sighs and looks at him with that sort of dreamy, unfocused longing that makes the whole world seem to soften at the edges. That sort of thing doesn't come naturally to me. But when I see her do it, I feel sort of dreamy by association. Tam is a romantic. It's, it, it infuses her singing. It probably makes her a good actress too. I put my name down, squeezed at the bottom of the sheet because there aren't any spots left. Who knows, this might be my chance to talk to Tam without Steve Harrington around. This is my way of the loop. This is my chance. Hey Robin, are you signing up for this? Someone behind me asked. I whip around so fast that the pencil, which is still in my hand, comes detached from the wall, and the, and the string whips Milton directly in the eyes. Ah, okay, ouch. Why were you skulking like that, I ask. Skulking? I'm not sure you know the definition of that word. I'm right in the middle of the hallway. He laughs at himself nervously. Then he blinks a few times. Can you, um, look at my corneas and make sure... They're not scratched. I put my face weirdly close to his face and inspect his eyes, which are dark brown, and I have his black bangs falling into them. I have to hold his bangs to one side and push my face forward to, towards his again, and then rotate so I can see his corneas in all kinds of different light. My face just keeps twitching angles, and his face becomes blurry and then sharp and then blurry again. I wonder if this is what kissing feels like, minus the lips. It's not that thrilling. Um, so why did you freak out so bad when I walked up to you? Milton asked quietly. He probably is worried, but I don't want him around. Milton is always a little afraid that people don't like him. I don't want him to worry about that, but I definitely want to mention why I whipped around so quickly and nearly impaled his left eyeball which is not scratched, thank goodness. I don't have money for his optometry bills. But if I want to go to Europe, um, the truth is, 
I was touching Tam's name. My fingers were just resting on it, lightly. I turned around so fast, so fast because I didn't want anyone to see and, and think that it meant anything. Because it didn't. I just... You'd look good with, with a good eye patch, I deadpanned when in doubt, sarcasm. Like Kurt Russell in Escape from New York. You think I like Kurt Russell? Milton asked, perking with some kind of delight that I really didn't expect. A half-Japanese Kurt Russell, of course. Milton's mom is Japanese. He doesn't want to talk about it that much. And honestly, there aren't that many kids at Hawkins High who are something other than white or black. It must be weird for him in ways that I can't really begin to fathom. Of course, I say. It's more than we've talked on... It's more than we've talked one-on-one -on -one since the beginning of the year. Last year, Melton and I talked way more. We'd write notes back and forth in the margins of our sheet music, mostly about music we liked, like more than whatever stuffy old Miss Genovese had us playing. But for some reason, Milton's been widely quiet around me since we got back from summer break. Maybe it's because Kate and Dash take up all the air with their flirting. Or maybe it's because he can sense there's something off about me, something different. My band nerd camouflage might be fading. The ways that I'm different from friends feels like they're multiplying. My heartbeat plays triple time as I reattach the stupid dangling pencil to the wall. Are you trying out for the play? Milton tries again, pointing at my cramped signature on the sheet. It's already there, so I can't really say no. I think I might not actually make it. I might have to stay home and shampoo the dog or or something. You don't have a dog, Robin. Which is why I'm going to get really good at dog shampooing to help convince my parents I should have one. Why am I lying? Why am I lying about dogs? Am I really afraid that Milton will tell everyone that I'm trying out for the play and acting generally bizarre? Will he report back to the rest of the odd squad? Has Dash already told everyone about Operation Croissant? I'm suddenly feeling very protective of my whole plan, my whole existence. It's because a small part of me already wants to jump ship on band and spend the rest of the season in play rehearsals. With Tam? Because even though we, we haven't talked quite yet, I can see us becoming inseparable. I'm just doing this to make Mr. Hauser happy. I lie because the truth is a little too intense to admit. He really, really wants me to try out. And I'll read chapter 12 in just a minute. Hey, you guys, if you've been enjoying me reading, um, I hope you guys will subscribe if you're not a subscriber. And if you've never been in a uh, musical, you might consider being in a musical. Incidentally, I was in Anything Goes back in the early 90s when I was in high school. It's a fun musical to be in. Chapter 12, September 23rd, 1983. Mr. Hauser doesn't exactly beam when he sees me walk into the auditorium, but his lack of a frown feels like the same thing. I can tell that he's happy that I made it, and for a single moment, I feel weirdly guilty that I'm mostly here to see if I can find someone to currently befriend and eventually go to Europe with me. Yes. My first hope is Tam, but it feels like there are people in this school who are going to care about culture. They're going to be in this auditorium, right? Looking around, I get the sense that maybe my initial estimation was wrong. Sprawled over the folding auditorium chairs, freshmen, girls are working on their makeup in mass, trying to get the perfect electric blue eyeliner and pouty puffy magenta lips. A mixed-gender group of upperclassmen down in the orchestra pit are gleefully giving each other um, back rubs. I can't for the life of me figure out how random back rubs are supposed to make someone a better actor. Are these people all, all here to show off and get on each other? If so, why bother putting on a play? Robin, 
Mr. Hauser says, brandishing a, a handful of paper in my direction. I want you to read for Emily. Great, I say, taking the pages and heading for the door. I have an excellent exit strategy. I'm going to pretend I want to practice my lines privately in the hallway. Then I'm going to run. But in the row right before the double exit doors, I see Tam sitting by herself, quietly mouthing lines as she scans the script's pages. Excuse me. Which I guess are called sides. Because Mr. Halter keeps saying that as he hands them out, mine still have that burnt, fresh from the Xerox smell to them. It combines with the smell of Tam's raspberry scented product soap. And deep down, I know that those smells will remind me of her of her from now on. Fresh new pages and tart red sweetness. That sounds right to me for some inexplicable, inex, inexplicable reason. Maybe it's just more evidence that I'm the weirdest girl in Hawkins, Indiana, as Mr. Hauser dubbed me. I'm still not sure I want that crown. Tam looks like she's pretty focused, heads down. I want to interrupt her while she's getting ready, but this might be my only chance to talk to her without the threat of Steve Harrington looming, looming nearby. I think about her singing in class. I think about how she wasn't afraid to be seen, to be heard, to be different. What if Tam really is the person I'm looking for? I go and sit down in her general vicinity just to see if she's interested in talking to someone. Of course, now that I'm sitting, I need something to do. So I look through the sides, but my eyes aren't really absorbing the words. They seem to be bouncing right off and go back to Tam. The third time she notices me looking. You have Emily too? She asks, craning over to see my pages. She looks so bold and carefree to me since the start of the year. But right now, she seems a little nervous, like she's afraid that I might poach her uh, part, as if I could honestly hold someone's attention as well as she could. Yeah, but I didn't ask Mr. Hauser to give me these. It was a random page assignment. Really? You're really not trying out for the lead, she asked, her upper body hovering over the seat that separates us. No, I rushed to assure her. I'm cool with anything. Those are not the words that have ever left my mouth before in any permutation. Still, I can see that whatever I, I said made Tam feel better. She settles back into her chairs and smiles. Not a big, fake, showy theater smile. Not a vague, I know you from history class smile. She's looking at me like any other girl at Hawkins High. For some reason, that terrifies me. Because I'm not any girl at Hawkins High. I'm the one slinking around, trying not to be noticed. Because I'm weird. Weird enough that even teachers can see it from a mile away. I might want to be friends with Tam, but if she doesn't like me, the actual strange, scrappy me, that seems like kind of a rejection I don't need to put myself through. And it might catch other people's attention. What if people think, I'm trying to climb the social ladder by spending time with her. What if this is what awakens the monster? It, it's, mouth, it's mouth waiting for me, like a dark pit when I inevitably fall. Would I, will I be ridiculed so hard that I don't even speak for the next three years like Sheena? Are you okay? Tam asks as I get up, wobbly. All I can think is, this is why I have to leave. This is why I have to leave. This is why I have... Robin! Mr. Hauser calls. Why don't you come up and get us started? I can hear my voice. I can hear my voice, but I can't feel it leaving my throat. I haven't had time to go over. I'll go first, Mr. Hauser, Tam says, popping out of her chair so fast that it, fast that it folds back behind her. It's nice of her, I think, to volunteer like that to save me from whatever humiliation was waiting. But the bang of her chair was a little too loud and her hair looked so red and I'm really, really overwhelmed right now. Thanks, Tammy, Mr. Hauser says in a voice so flatly chipper that I can tell he's full of shit. 
He didn't want Tam to read. He wanted me to read. I can't begin to understand why he cares so much. He can't be he can't be because he thinks I'm the next great high school leading lady. I'm clearly not cut out for acting. Even just getting to the part where I actually audition is proving difficult. I shove myself back into my seat and stay put because now I know that if we do leave, Mr. Hauser will see it happen and he'll want to talk about it next week. And besides, Tam is standing on stage taking a deep breath, diving into that monologue head first, and it wouldn't be fair to interrupt her by the, by the slamming the doors. And I want to see what she does. Tam nearly shouts the first few lines, where all, where are all, which are all about being dead. People in the audience snicker, probably because they don't know how this play ends. Most of this ta most of this takes place in a, pitif in a pitifully normal small town named Grover's Corner. Grover's Corners. But toward the end, the main character Emily dies, and becomes a ghost. And well, she stays in Grover's Corners forever. I only know this much about our town because I read it during my existential phase. I made Kate binge. Jean-Paul Sartre, and I might be mispronouncing that, sorry guys, and Simon de Beauvoir and Richard Wright with me. Most people think that Thornton Wilder is a product of pure apple pie Americana, but he was part of a desperate global search for meaning. And his work can be, can be seen, and his work can be searing as Camus, if you're really paying attention. Most people aren't. Can you start again, Miss Thompson? Mr. Hauser asked, a little less volume this time. Really let us know what Emily is feeling, what she wants to say to her mother, what it feels like in that moment when she realizes no one who's alive will ever hear her again. Tom nods and nods, like she's really taking in what Mr. Hauser is saying. Then she starts over. And does the same thing. Toward the end, Emily asked to go back to her grave. Tam opens her mouth wide and starts to sing. I don't recognize the song. Something churchy. It takes everyone a second to figure out what's going on, because none of us are expecting it. Mr. Hauser paces in the front of the stage, two fingers pinched on the bride of his nose. Miss Thompson, if you could just pause there. She must know that he's about to tell her that he's seen enough because she launches into a breathlessly fast explanation. I just think Emily could be a singer. You know, maybe maybe she sings with her church choir. That should fit into the script the way it's already written. There's no singing in our town, Mr. Hauser says. It's not a musical. It doesn't have to be a musical to have music in it. Tam looks proud of this statement. Like maybe she thought of it beforehand. She stands with her hands clenched tight on her script pages, waiting to be asked to wait waiting to be asked to continue. That's that's an interesting theory, Mr. Hauser clasps, which is a signal to the rest of us to applaud her audition. All right, thank you. Please stick around in case I need you to read with a scene partner later. Tam leaves the stage and looking distinctly upset. Part of me wants to follow her, to tell her that I think she was brave. Robin, Mr. Hauser says, are you ready? No, not close, not even remotely. Sure, I say, as I make it to the front of the auditorium. I catch a bit of a quiet argument that Jimmy Blythe is making to Mr. Hauser. I know Jimmy from Anything Goes last year. He was the set designer, nominally, but he spent most of his time backstage hitting on the chorus girls who were waiting for their cues. Seriously? Two ladders and a dining room set? That's the entire set? This is my senior year and you want me to do nothing? It's not nothing, I say. I know 
I'm trying to fly under the radar, but sometimes I can't help myself. Mr. Hauser is watching me now, waiting for what I'll say next. Thornton Wilder, Wilder was adapting Asian theater practices where there's a minimalist set design and one physical item could stand in symbolically for all kinds of things. He's trying to stretch your limit, limited little imagination. Mr. Hauser gives a single chortle. As soon as his back is turned, Jimmy mutters, I'll punch your limited face. Yep, this is definitely the haven for the most cultured kids in school. There are no stairs in the, to the stage, so I have to slide up on my butt and then get to my feet. Go ahead, Robin, Mr. Hauser says. I look at the audience. Nobody really seems to be watching me. Most people are doing homework or, or buffing their nails or passing notes. It should be a comfort knowing that nobody cares, but for some reason it just makes Emily's words ring true. She says that none of us really notice every minute in detail as they pass by. She says that we're all missing our own lives, and we have no one to blame but ourselves. Oh, Earth. You're too wonderful for anybody to realize you, I say, quoting, quoting from the script, but also meaning it. This is why I want to travel, to see the world, to fill my life with, with things that matter. Art, music, food, so good it makes you cry. Conversation, so interesting. Um, it keeps you up all night. All I want to do, all I want to do, all of it with someone who understands. Someone who appreciates it as much as I do. I honestly think that I'm, I'm a misanthrope by accident of geography, not by nature. If I weren't surrounded by dinguses, I'd probably have plenty of friends. Standing here and saying Emily's words about growing up in a small town and never leaving, and then dying and then never leaving, is making me so claustrophobic that I'm walking around just to escape the sound of my own voice. And then there's the infamous staging that Jimmy was complaining about. Emily's grave? It's a metal folding chair in a row of metal folding chairs where she was. She has to sit with the other people in her town who's, who died. She has to stay there with them. She can't even switch spots and try out a new cemetery view. She's stuck, literally, eternally. When I think about it, I can't breathe right, and my voice comes out raw and winded. Nice, Robin. Keep going, Mr. Hauser thinks. I'm making acting choices when I'm just plain old freaking out. Part of me wants to power through the moment, to spend the next three months in rehearsals, telling off a-holes like Jimmy, making Mr. Hauser not frown, seeing Tam every afternoon, spending enough time together, going on a trip as best friends is just the natural next step. Tam wants to be a singer, right? You can't be a singer if you stay in Hawkins your whole life. We can breathe out. We can we can break out of here together. Stage a two-person rebellion against everything that makes our lives small and bleak. Only a few lines left. Almost there. But I run out of breath, and then I can't get it back. And everything goes blacker than blacker. And I'll read chapter 13 and 14 very soon, and then we'll start part two.